as a little bit of background, so I'm Laura Ferricks. I'm the executive director of the Research Park and Enterprise Works. And one of the programs we've had almost the entire time I've been in this particular role is an entrepreneur in residence program run through Enterprise Works and the Research Park serving entrepreneurs. And some of those EIRs are even on the call today. But prior to that, before our operation took over that kind of responsibility and configured the program the way our clients know it today as a free resource, there was early work being done and that included with Illinois Ventures and Neil Kane as one of the original entrepreneurs and residents that was serving clients that were working on commercialization of technology from the University of Illinois. So many of the folks um, I guess nearly 20 years ago, started to meet with Neil as somebody who had expertise in this research commercialization and technology transfer area. And he also was one of the original leaders, founders of a company called Advanced Diamond Tech, which would go on to raise significant money, have lots of federal funding and um, grow in the Chicago area. So um, those are some of the experiences he had right in our own walls at Enterprise Works and part of the early days of trying to work on how we would do a better job of startup and entrepreneurship activities at the University of Illinois that included Illinois Ventures, the Office of Technology Management and Enterprise Works working together. Now, since then, Neil moved out of our community and has had a number of roles that he's gonna tell you about, I'm sure. But most recently, we reconnected via Facebook um, uh, in addition to conversations we've had over the years uh, briefly, and that he had become an author of a new book about innovation. And of course, for our companies in the research park, we thought this was appropriate, both for our entrepreneurs and some of our larger companies that may be joining us today. And so Neil's trying to quantify it, much like a scientist maybe would approach something of trying to come up with um, a more uh, specific and programmatic sort of approach to this of how do you do innovation. But as we all know, there's a lot of art that goes into it as well. So I think he'll talk about the balance of those things and how do you inspire change and come up with truly innovative companies. So thanks for joining us today, Neil. It's certainly easier to do that when we don't have to travel. We can have people from out of state virtually um, rejoin us, but this is somebody um, that we have known for many years. So welcome back, Neil. Thank you, Laura. It's good to see familiar faces again. Uh, I welcome all of you participants to turn your cameras on if you're comfortable, but if you wouldn't mind muting your microphones, though, I'm sure that that will help make sure that you can hear me well. Um, you know, uh, Laura, I was reflecting today, I don't, I'm sure it wasn't the last time I was at Enterprise Works, but you had me speak um, shortly after I left Advanced Diamond Technologies. That was on October 5th, 2011. And I remember that date specifically for two reasons, one good one and one unfortunate one. Number one, Laura, I think that was your 21st birthday. Uh, and I remember um, I did, Neil. singing happy birthday to you in the atrium of Enterprise Works that afternoon. Um, but as I was driving back home later that day to Naperville where I used to live, uh, I heard on the radio that Steve Jobs had died. So that date is just like really seared in my memory. Uh, but again, thank you for the opportunity. Let me go over to PowerPoint and share my screen. My biggest um, reservation today is just not having enough time to talk about everything that I would love to talk about and that I could talk about. As Laura mentioned, the uh, opportunity to reconnect with everybody and speak today is due to the fact that a book which I co-authored came out a couple of weeks ago, but I was also asked to talk just a little bit about my background. So I'm trying to walk a fine line and accomplish two different things today. One is talking about the book and two is just being the old guy in the room now imparting a little bit of wisdom and reflection on some of the things that I've done in my career. So I'm going to try to do both, but I invite questions. I think we've got a manageable group here and somebody else is apparently monitoring the chat. So if you have questions for me, please speak up and uh, I'll do my best to adjust my cadence as we go. This is a little bit about my background. I won't go through all of this, um, but I invite uh, those of you who would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, but specifically the slides here or a nearly identical version are available on the top of my LinkedIn profile. So if any of you want the slides, for posterity's sake or you want to take notes on them, you can uh, take advantage of them there. As Laura mentioned, um, I really think of myself as a serial entrepreneur and I came to 
uh, Enterprise Works, I think even before it officially opened, probably in about the year 2000. But I relocated my family there to Champaign. I, I'm a graduate of the U of I, uh, but came back in 2004 and was working for what was, I think, version 1.0 of Illinois Ventures. Not quite sure what form it takes today or who's still around. I know Rob is. Uh, but I'm not sure about the others. But uh, anyway, this is what the composition looked like at the time. And so I was the first entrepreneur in residence because once the university started focusing on tech commercialization and was beginning to build out the research park, John Banta, who was in charge at the time, realized that they needed people who had some experience actually building companies. And so I was often the co-founder or counterweight to a grad student or a professor and help them launch their companies. And through that time, I worked uh, on many businesses. I don't know that you'll know the names any longer, but um, I worked with Phil Krein, getting SmartSpark off the ground, and Larry Markoski, who was a grad student at the time. And I worked with Yi Lu and Ken Suslick and John Rogers, who's now at um, Northwestern and many others. Now, a little bit more about my background as an entrepreneur. People sometimes find it ironic or maybe even humorous that my very first entrepreneurial foray was making barbecue sauce. But when I got out of the MBA program at the University of Chicago, um, I was basically unemployed and there was a very unappealing job market. This was in the early 90s. And so I was inspired to try to start a company to bring to market this famous barbecue sauce that my grandfather had uh, invented at the restaurant that he had in Chicago in the 1930s. So all of this is a true story. And if I had more time, I could go into the lessons that I learned. But suffice it to say, this was my first exposure to starting a business. And the key takeaway from all of that, since I did this immediately following getting an MBA, was the extraordinary difference in learning that you get between sitting in a classroom or hearing other people's stories and actually doing something yourself. So even though it was a simple product and a small business, um, what I learned and took away from it was amazing. Back to my time at Enterprise Works, I mentioned one of the companies that I worked on at the time, it was called SmartSpark Energy Systems. Then uh, it became SolarBridge. They later wound up moving to Austin, Texas, but I was um, the interim CEO in helping that company get off the ground for a couple of years during its foundational time. And another company that I also helped launch, even though this happened while I was in Champaign, the technology actually comes out of Argonne National Laboratory. And I co-founded a company called Advanced Diamond Technologies with two physicists from Argonne, one of whom is also a U of I grad. And uh, we basically made synthetic diamond. And when my uh, uh, period of time as EIR ended, the launching off point for me was going into this company and becoming full-time CEO. And I ran the business for about the next six or seven years uh, until about 2011. During that time, we raised, I think, about $12 million through angels and institutional VCs, raised about another eight or nine million through SBIRs and, and the like. And so this, for me, was um, unquestionably the most intense startup experience I had as a leader. And you know, now that I'm more or less an educator, a lot of my experience is informed by what I did at Advanced Diamond. And so just about every startup issue known to mankind from raising money to almost being out of business to quality issues, IP issues, personnel issues, board issues, you know, I've I've lived all of it through that. This is a uh, newer uh, web page for the company. And uh, about a year and a half ago, the company was actually acquired. So, uh, so there was a good outcome uh, for that. More recently, um, I was or am still the CEO of a company called Moving Parts LLC. I bring this to your attention because my co-founder in this business was an undergraduate student from Illinois Tech, the Illinois Institute of Technology. And he was like 20 years old at the time that he came up with this puzzle idea. You can clearly see that it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube, but not exactly. And uh, he, uh, uh, my, my partner, Dane, um, always kind of had this idea in his mind of doing this sort of thing, but it wasn't until he got to his university and had access to 3D printers 
and the other uh, resources that were available to him through the entrepreneurship program there that he was able to figure out exactly how to do this. And so um, I joined him as kind of, again, the, the experienced guy dealing with the financial issues and the um, business model issues and the logistics and so forth. And uh, at least for a couple of years, we had a really, really good profitable business making X cubes. It's very fun to talk about. And uh, if I had more time, I would take you through the whole arc of what we learned there. In the first couple of minutes here in my talk, I want to just share some lessons that I've learned. And then in a few minutes, I'll transition into talking about my book and what we did in, in that so that you can uh, hopefully take away some, some good techniques. And I'm sure People like uh, Alan Singleton will smile or wince as I go through some of these lessons here. But the first and most important lesson, especially for those of you who are working on businesses, is investors don't fund businesses, they fund people. And if you, and, and if you really sort of embrace and begin to understand the distinction between uh, those two ways of looking at the world, you'll, you'll find yourself uh, in much better shape. Um, I've, I've learned the hard way. I've learned firsthand and now I see it everywhere I go, <laughs> mentoring other teams, especially young people at the university level, that fear, the imposter syndrome, anxiety, shame, all of these kinds of emotions very quickly enter in, especially when you really don't know what you're doing. And it's almost axiomatic that most entrepreneurs don't, especially if you're doing something innovative. It's almost always the case that you're trying to do something that nobody's ever accomplished. And so dealing with just kind of what's going on in your headspace uh, is a huge issue. And it's infinitely harder than it appears. Even the great successes are challenging and most startups don't become successful. Um, I have a lot of respect uh, for other entrepreneurs and have developed uh, some empathy and appreciation for what it is to go through it. By the same token, it's a lot easier to criticize than it is to do. And I find myself even today having to catch myself out of this temptation to want to tell other people what I think is wrong with their business idea. And that's wholly inappropriate. It's not my job. And so you really need to be, you, you want to listen to experienced people and get guidance and advice, but be very careful about people who are critical but unhelpful. Um, unless they really have the, the experience to back up their stories. I recommend to everybody, especially faculty founders, that they get trusted business advisors. Because what I learned often coming in as kind of the hired gun CEO is I would be trying to explain to people who've never been around startups before things that to them appeared very counterintuitive terms and conditions around license agreements and understanding about the control provisions that investors might get if they finance your business. A lot of that was just very confusing and off-putting to people who had never done it before, so much so that it often became an impediment when people thought that they were getting screwed when in fact they were not. So my recommendation is find somebody in your camp who is loyal to you, but who has the experience who can help you. Not every company should get venture capital. Uh, the X Cube, the business that I talked about, uh, we were able to ramp up very quickly and got bank financing um, because we were very quickly generating money. Um, so venture capital often dominates a lot of these kinds of seminars and talks, but not every business is appropriate for venture capital. There's a lot of different ways to build successful businesses and I would encourage you to uh, Make sure that you're really listening to data. You know, intuition is an important part of the process, of course, but be metrics driven. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you think, it's how the markets respond that are gonna determine whether or not your business is successful. Uh, finally, uh, it's also important, especially if you're going to be asking other people for money, that you understand what your exit is going to look like. Uh, if you can't articulate that, you're going to find it difficult to raise money. And then my advice for students basically um, is to really work on your communication skills. And you rarely hear people talk about the value of project management. But as again, somebody who's been through this many times, the ability to know what you need to do to plan your work, to be accountable for the results and the time frame on which you're going to do it, 
are really, really, really important. Note here that I'm not talking about any particular expertise. You could be a humanities major, you could be a computer science major. To me, that's much less important than a lot of your sort of cross-functional skills in how you behave and contribute to a startup. And then the last point is if you want to be an entrepreneur or particularly the CEO of a company, you better learn how to sell because you're going to be spending an awful lot of time doing that, not just selling your product, but selling yourself to investors, selling your vision to people that you're trying to recruit to join your team and so forth. And back to the fear question, you know, um, you've probably heard people say this a lot, but in Silicon Valley, they really value entrepreneurs who've kind of been there, done that. And even if they so-called failed, um, they're still highly sought after for their expertise. That's kind of less common uh, in the Midwest, but a good way to sort of think about protecting your kind of downside risk, if you will, is that you either make your business successful or you'll learn something. And if you learn something, you can still propel and accelerate your career. And I've seen this happen many times, even by having what we might call a quote unquote failure. So if you think about uh, the outcome in these terms, sometimes it's a lot easier to get past uh, the anxiety and the other issues. And this is my last slide on, on, on this point. To founders, again, whether you're a student or a faculty founder, the first conversation that I always have with people is to really understand what's your motivation. Um, everybody's got to have a motivation. It can be to make money. It can be to want to help people, to solve a social problem, to get your technology out into the world, to become famous, to help your career arc, to get published. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Um, many motivations can be sufficient, but the importance here is that you are in tune to that and you understand it because your motivation is going to influence uh, who you hire, how you communicate your vision, the type of investors you want to align yourself with, what your exit is going to look like, the control that you want to have, and so forth. And then I just point out the very, very last bullet, which I highlighted, you know, know thyself. The first step is actually getting clarity around your own motivation rather than just jumping right into the business, okay? Um, I'm just going to pause briefly are there any questions or any remarks? Otherwise, I'm going to do a pretty hard transition here and now start to talk about the book. But I'll give everybody an opportunity if they want to jump in with anything. Neil, can you speak a little bit too? I like some of your points about different paths towards startup uh, or small business and that not everybody should be seeking VC funding. That can be a hard conversation as it seems like that is heralded by society as a success metric, but it's not right for every company. How do you coach as an EIR um, through uh, entrepreneurs and inventors that are considering this without that being seen as a negative piece of advice? That's a great question. I, I think it's a longer conversation and I'd be happy to have it with you know anybody who's out looking for it. The first thing is to understand that if you think that you are seeking venture capital, you have to understand that you're going to be giving up control of your company to outside investors. So clearly there's sort of this cultural kind of macho sort of thing or this reverence that we have for people who manage to raise venture capital, but it comes at a huge cost. And significantly, as an owner of, or a founder of a business, you're far better off not raising venture capital if you can avoid it. And so some businesses like Advanced Diamond Technologies, I mean, we needed $25 million to get you know, product in the market. And so that was clearly the kind of company that required venture capital. But in the case of the X-Cube, you know, we just needed a couple hundred thousand dollars and were able to find that money in different ways and thereby retain a lot of control and all of the profits for, for the founders. So the punchline is, you, you got to understand whether the business requires venture capital. You have to appreciate what you're going to give up in terms of getting it, the kind of control that your investors will have. And, uh, and then beyond that, it's just, you know, kind of situational. But my advice to founders is venture capital should be a last resort, not a first resort. Okay. I, did I answer your question, Laura? I just want to make sure it's... Yeah, that's great. Let's move on to your formula. All right, very good. So thank you. Uh, and again, to the rest of you, again, please speak up or enter something in the chat box if you have questions. So I'm doing a hard pivot now. What I just got done talking about was kind of my experience. It's 
it's wonderful talking about myself, who doesn't like to do that. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about a book and try to give you hopefully some some takeaways that might help you in thinking about bringing your products to market. So the, the name of the book, of course, is The Innovator Secret Formula. I want to acknowledge my co-authors. I did not write this alone. And in particular, Chris Sorensen is also a U of I grad. So I wanted to make sure that that was mentioned. And Chris and Matt and I all kind of have different backgrounds. Uh, Chris and Matt were in Silicon Valley for a long, long time. I began my career there, but for the most part, I'm a Midwesterner. So we all contributed different things from our background. I want to begin by using this slide from CB Insights. And what we've done here is identified the top five reasons, of the top five of the, you know, they list the top 20 if you read the whole article. But these are the top five reasons why startups fail. No market need overwhelmingly is the top one running out of cash, not the right team, getting out competed, pricing cost issues, and four out of the five, there's not much that we can address today in talking about the team, but the other four are all related to this notion of what we call product market fit, and whether or not you as a company have developed a product that provide the right kind of service or features or benefits to the target market that you're addressing. And so in one sentence, the book is all about doing a deep dive on product market fit, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Even if you're familiar with the concept, uh, we try to take it to a new level, which I'll get to. So to begin, there's basically three laws of disruption. Everybody, I think, probably thinks about or fantasizes about wanting to have a disruptive company or disrupt an industry. It's a lot harder to do than it appears, of course, but the um, financial gains can be astronomical if you're actually successful in doing it. But we've codified three laws. The first law of disruption is disruption comes to us all. And what we mean by that, and some of you may have seen a slide like this in the past, it is really true that things are accelerating. We often say that, but it's really, really true. And so what this slide shows, and I, I doubt you can see a mouse if I try to hover over it, is the amount of time that it's taken for different innovations. You can see them listed over on the right, radio, microwave, automobile, computer, et cetera, from the time they were introduced to when they achieved some certain threshold, say 60 or 80% of penetration in US households. And so if you look at the innovations that were introduced in the early part of the 20th century, radio, automobile, et cetera, washing machine, you can see that it took 20, 30, 40 years in some cases to reach that high level of penetration. And then if you look over on the right and see things introduced more recently, smartphones, social media, uh, and tablet computers, just to name three, you can see how they've reached that same penetration in just a couple of years. So it's not your imagination, things really are speeding up, product cycles are shorter, it's a lot harder to compete when things move this quickly. I just, it's kind of fascinating, I draw your attention, I don't know if you can make it out exactly, but over on the far right where it says landline, if you follow that green line back, what you can see is that the telephone actually got to, like, or landlines rather, got to 90 some penetration, 90% penetration, and then as the smartphone became ascendant, people stopped using their landlines and the landlines actually on the decline. And that's what you call disruption, you know, coming in and disrupting an incumbent industry. The second law of disruption is all disruption is caused by changes in product market fit. Product market fit to set the stage is the degree to which a product satisfies a strong market demand. Mark Andreessen, famously also a U of I graduate, said um, product market fit is the only thing that matters because really what else could it be? I highly recommend reading this sort of famous blog post. The link is there at the bottom of the slide. He goes into a long, long recitation about the characteristics of startups, which ones succeed, which ones don't, what matters, what doesn't. And at the end, he concludes product market fit is it. If you don't have it, you can't be successful. If you do have it, you can still screw up by not having the right team, for example, but it's an essential ingredient. So our third law of disruption is there's only three ways to change product market fit, and that's what we kind of do a deep dive on in the book. So I'm, I'm keep coming back to this definition of what product market fit is to make sure that you really, really understand this. And if it's all you take away from my talk today, I think your time will 
still be valuable. So product market fit, again, is this match between what customers want and what a product provides. And this, um, of course, would apply to a service as well. The better the fit, the higher the market share. There's tons of literature and everybody talks about product market fit. This is not our idea. This has been around for a long time. Everybody knows that more is better, but nobody's really come out with a way to quantify what that means or how you can objectively measure product market fit. And that's what we've attempted to do in the book. But first, I'm going to continue to kind of drill into this idea of thinking about what product market fit is. If you just randomly, I just, you know, took a look at coffee makers on Amazon to try to make the point here, okay? All four of these products do ostensibly the same thing. They make coffee. And if you were an entrepreneur or a founder who said, hey, I'm going to start a company to do coffee makers, you can very quickly appreciate that there's an enormous difference between a $25 Mr. Coffee that makes 12 cups of drip coffee at a time, you know, $170 Keurig, which makes a single cup at a time, plus has all of these espresso and cappuccino attachments, or, you know, this thing, this $5,800, you know, whatever that is, okay? So it's not enough to just understand your product. You need to understand your market. Okay, and success is not about the features of the product, it's about how they meet the needs of your market. And so a $25 Mr. Coffee clearly is targeted at a different market than this $5,800 thing, okay, over here on the right, even though ostensibly they kind of do the same thing. Everybody understands this with automobiles, right? There's cheap cars, there's luxury cars, there's SUVs, there's vans, there's trucks, Okay, and they all serve the, the same purpose, which is to get you from point A to point B, but their markets are different, the needs of the people who buy them are different, the way they're promoted are different. Okay, that is what product market fit is all about. You can think of it as sort of like being a key, okay, that unlocks these different attributes. And what you can see there, total cost of ownership, performance, etc. I'm going to drill down into that in a moment. But uh, and, and we've created this thing which we call customer value models, which again is this attempt at kind of quantifying or giving you a framework for objectively thinking about product market fit. The point of all of this is that competitive advantage comes from having better product market fit. What else could it be, as Mark Andreessen said at the bottom? And the way in which, or the manifestation or the effect of having better competitive advantage for your business could be higher profitability, higher market share, better customer loyalty, lower cost of acquisition, higher lifetime value, blah, blah, blah. There's different ways of measuring these different attributes, but they're all manifestations of product market fit. If you have low product market fit, this is what most days feel like. And if you've ever been a part of a company that has high product market fit, this is what your day is like. I'm not diminishing the challenge of managing a high growth company, but I would certainly take that challenge uh, over one that doesn't have high product market fit. And so I can tell you from my own experience, I've been involved in many companies, most, okay, that have gotten a product to market. Everybody's kind of excited. You, you know, you might have some initial traction from some customers, but unless you really get that product market fit, your chances are you're not gonna be successful in the long run. So to get back to, you know, what's in the book, okay? There's three components of product market fit. The first is a product's value dimensions. Those are characteristics of the products. I'll go through this in a moment. The importance or the weight of each dimension and the performance for a particular product in each dimension. Okay, so the only way to improve product market fit is to change one or more of these dimensions. And remember what I said a moment ago, the only way to be disruptive is by changing product market fit. So our thesis is that everything sort of boils down to this. Let me talk first about value dimensions. You can think of every product as really a portfolio of value. So if we look at that motorcycle on the left, um, you know, performance, style, price, brand, total cost of ownership, these are all attributes dimensions, if you will, characteristics that customers might use to think about the product. And as you could well imagine, some motorcycles are, 
you know, super high performance, they're fast, they're sleek, others are maybe, you know, more utility kind of things. And what these blue bars represent are sort of like um, histograms or quantification of how important these attributes are to customers. And I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. You can see the same thing's true with others, like in the case of uh, Coke, you know, its taste, whether it has caffeine, the reputation of the brand, its availability, etc. I think everybody can sort of intuitively get around this. And here are some additional examples of these customer value dimensions. They, you know, they're different for every product, right? I mean, the, the, you know, the way in which you think about the value of a soft drink is very different than the way you would think about the value of an operating system or a motorcycle. So these are just examples, but you have to think about how they apply to your particular company. So the customer value dimensions define which benefits customers care about that influence their buying decision. And as I just said, not everyone is applicable in every way for every customer, okay? Um, let's just, if we were talking about vehicles, let's think about mileage, miles per gallon. For some customer segments, that's really, really, really important. And for other customer segments, it's just not, okay? So the customer value dimension is specific to the product and the market that you're going after. And these are just some examples. So let's say you had a product where quality, durability, and price were three factors, i.e. value dimensions that customers were interested in. The next thing you have to do, and you typically uncover this through your own market research, through focus groups, through customer discovery, through understanding your customers, is you have to develop a model whereby you understand the relative importance of these dimensions to your customer. So in this totally fictitious example, we assume that uh, there's a 50% weighting on quality, 30% on durability, 20% on price, totals up to 100%. So the customer value weight is a measure of how important is that attribute to the customer? How much do they care, okay? And the value dimensions and the weights create what we call the customer value model, all right? And then lastly, the last piece is your product performance. How well does a product satisfy customers in each value dimension? So if you were targeting a market where your customers valued quality at 50%, you know, half of the buying criteria is based on perception of quality, then obviously if you were a low quality, cheap, product, and there's certainly room for that in the market, you might have a huge mismatch with your particular customer. But if you stood for quality, um, what would be a good example? Like the Herman Miller chair that I have in my office. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people go for Herman Miller, but it's, you know, a relatively prestige brand known for quality, durability as well. Okay, so product performance is this idea of what is the weighting and then the blue bars which just entered in there are the assessment of, the pro of your product in each of those value dimensions. So I'm assessing and saying, you know, my product uh, on the quality dimension is 90% good. It's not the very best quality, but it's pretty good. Okay, durability, 70% okay, and price, you know, I'm not going to be the cheapest. If I were the cheapest, then um, I would probably be ranked a little bit higher. So for those of you with accounting backgrounds or statistic background, this is just a, an expected value calculation. We're multiplying the product performance times the value dimension. And then over there on the right, you get this weight, you total it up, we get 74%. Okay. Now by itself, that number doesn't mean much. We call this, by the way, quantitative PMF or Q, product market fit. It's the weighted sum of the performance of your particular product against you know, the uh, needs or the expectations of your market. And at the end of the day, okay, um, it gives you a way of comparing different alternatives. All right, so if you were a product designer or if you were the entrepreneur who had the opportunity to make 
decisions about features, trade-offs, you know, should we spend a little bit more on this to improve our quality? Should we save money here, use a different vendor, skimp on something, remove a feature to make it cheaper? All of these kinds of decisions that people are constantly making when designing products can all be quantified and evaluated objectively through the customer value model. All right. And at the end of the day, what you would do is look at various alternatives. Again, 74% by itself doesn't give you the answer, but if you compared it to other options, you could look at your competition through a similar lens, would help you to understand which product is going to be more successful in the market. Because our claim, again, remains that the higher the product market fit, which is what QPMF measures, the more successful the product's going to be in the market. And voila, the secret innovation formula that we talk about in the book is just this. What we call delta, delta value is the difference in these weighted dimensions. So for those of you who are mathematically inclined, the 74% that we have there on the lower right, you know, that's the sum that you get of multiplying the performance of a product in a given dimension times the product weight. And then the, the delta is the difference between evaluating different alternatives. I hope that's clear. If any of you uh, have questions, again, speak up, because now I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. This slide just recaps some of the terminology. So let me just do this as a quick refresher and then we'll move on. So again, QPMF, quantified product market fit, describes how satisfied a market segment is with your product or service, and that ranges from zero to 100. The customer value model identifies the key value dimensions. The performance shows how well you do against that dimension, and then the delta value is a quantitative measure of your competitive advantage. So it only applies if we're comparing two or more different scenarios. And again, those could be contrasting your product against the, you know, the competition that's already in the market or using it as a diagnostic to make different kind of trade-off decisions. And our hypothesis or our th the thesis of the book is that the higher the delta value or rather delta value is the determinant or the primary driver of the other things that are directly correlated with high market share like net promoter score, um, lifetime value of a customer, customer acquisition cost, and so forth. Okay, I think that's it for the academic lesson. Now I'm going to talk about some examples and try to make this hit home a little bit more. And, uh, and I think I'm doing on time. I'll give you a fascinating example in a moment. So now that you've done this sort of diagnostic and you say, okay, um, you know, we can evaluate these different choices, you know, what are some of the steps that you can do to improve product market fit. And I'm not talking about the obvious thing like, oh, our quality sucks, so we need to improve it. We're talking about actual design things that you can do or changes that you could make to the product. So we claim that there's five different things that you could do to improve product market fit. There are three ways that you can improve the product, okay? Technology, design, and business model innovations. And I'll walk through those briefly in a moment or there are different things that you can do to educate or condition your market. You can uh, change the market's attitudes, or you can take your product and go after a completely different market altogether. So let's talk about those a little bit. So technology innovation, we're not talking about small improvements, we're talking about major leaps that have occurred due to completely new technology platforms. So if we think about lighting, Okay, once upon a time it was candles, everybody knows, you know, Edison invented the light bulb when CFLs, um, compact fluorescent bulbs came out, you know, they solved the same problem as the previous generation, but they were superior if we, you know, had modeled it according to the customer value model that I just showed you. Uh, and now everybody's familiar with LEDs, okay, so, you know, they're cheaper, they're brighter, they last longer in almost every way, unless you're looking for a source of heat, you know, LEDs are better than the things have, that have preceded them, okay? And this is what's meant by disruption, these sort of huge leaps. And when a new generation kind of comes out, it almost completely, you know, obliterates the previous generation. If we think about recorded music, here's another example. 
we went from physical, you know, analog recordings like on wax or vinyl records to like magnetic tape, which is antiquated as it seems today, was actually superior form factor to vinyl, then compact discs, and then, you know, MP3 players. Um, the iPod, of course, really provided a lot of the integration that made MP3s very popular. The MP3 format by itself was going nowhere until Apple figured out kind of how to package it. And then now it's just been subsumed into other kinds of devices, you know, like the iPhone and Alexa devices and so forth. But again, the same story, more storage, better quality for less cost. Who wouldn't want these improvements? I know that, you know, analog records are coming back a little bit because of their sound quality, but nobody uses magnetic tape anymore. And I don't know many people who use compact discs either. As we go along, you know, on almost every dimension, um, you know, the technology innovation has been superior. It's very uncommon, however, to be the inventor or the progenitor of something, you know, as disruptive and as earth shaking as a completely new technology platform. I know all of you, you know, work in the research park and certainly, you know, the U of I actually does have a legacy of spawning a couple of those kinds of things over the past several hundred years. But these are very, very, very uncommon. But when you do have a technology innovation like the MP3 player, for example, it enables entirely new business models. Because when, you know, the iTunes store came out, okay, suddenly there was a way that you could purchase recorded music that didn't require you to go to a store, okay, which was always true when I was a kid. All right, so technology innovations spawn new business models, which then creates new ways in which you can compete um, through you know, bundling and tying together and so forth, okay? Uh, or a technology innovation allows you to improve a product's performance in one or more value dimensions um, or create new value dimensions. And in a longer talk, I could go into each of these in more detail. Um, or, I'm sorry, or, uh, you know, also change the cost, okay? The second method, remember I showed you those three methods a couple of slides back. The second one is a design innovation, all right? And these are examples of not wholly new breakthroughs in technology ideas, but a better way of providing design, user interfaces, incorporating technologies from multiple places, you know, all to do different things. So an electric guitar replaced acoustic guitar, you know, still kind of the same sort of thing, but louder. The great innovation behind the iPhone was not any particular invention, but how it brought together all of these different technologies from the capacitive touchscreen to the integration with the software, to the integration with the phone, to the iTunes, et cetera. The minivan, um, was actually kind of an innovation that came out in the 80s. And, uh, you know, and Facebook is another example, okay? And then finally, um, business model innovations change the way that products are brought to market. And some examples could be the department store. Seems impossible to sort of comprehend today that that was once innovative, but prior to that, you had all these retail storefronts on Main Street, you know, and if you needed clothes, you went to one store, and if you needed shoes, you went to another store, and if you needed food, you went to another store, and if you, you know, if you needed a wallet or jewelry, you went to another store, and so department stores were actually quite innovative, and probably many of you know the stories of Marshall Fields and Selfridges and all of those kinds of uh, great entrepreneurs of 100 years ago, but you can see some of the others, even like Starbucks, okay, they surely did not invent coffee, and coffee houses were plentiful and common, you know, prior to Starbucks coming along, but they just created consistency and a brand and quality, and um, they they turned the coffee house into a meeting organ, a meeting place for communities, and you know, and did so very very effectively. You can see some of the other examples there. Okay, then going back to the slide I showed you before, there were two ways of changing the market's attitudes. If again your goal is to increase your product market fit. So if you're stuck with a product, okay, or you can't change the product for whatever reason, you can think about different markets. So the first one is change customers' attitudes about the importance of a value dimension. And I'll give you a great example here, okay, Crisco. 
hopefully many of you know, it's, it's shortening. It's basically kind of like solid oil, <laughs> if you will. You cook with it, okay? Um, but uh, what Crisco did was it uh, actually disrupted the market for lard, okay? If we go back 115 years or so ago, uh, Procter & Gamble, actually they started out in the candle business. Um, and remember a slide that I showed you back a little while ago, obviously Edison's incandescent bulb, you know, completely decimated the candle business. So if you're Procter & Gamble 120 years ago with all of this infrastructure for making candles and then suddenly the electric light bulb comes out, you know, you've got a problem on your hand. Okay, and what they had in terms of their fixed cost and their infrastructure was cottonseed mills, eight of them, I understand, producing cottonseed oil from which they made candles and then of course Procter & Gamble got into the soap business as well, which is another famous story. Okay, so suddenly they were stuck with, you know, all of this infrastructure, kind of like, you know, record companies had when CDs came out and they had to do something about it. So the way they looked at it was what, are, what is a new product that we can make from this abundant supply of cottonseed oil that we have? And what they discovered was that by hydrogenating or adding hydrogen to liquid cottonseed oil, they could turn it into a solid that resembled lard. And so what they came up with was Crisco and the name there is actually an acronym that means crystallized cottonseed oil, okay? So it was kind of an invention of a new product, if you will, targeting an existing market. Lard was, you know, very famous and very plentiful, available in every, you know, grocery store probably in the world at that time. Uh, for any kind of baking or frying or whatever, you know, lard was what you used. It was well known and liked kind of like butter. And then Cisco, or uh, excuse me, Crisco comes out with this synthetic product and uh, in actuality, in taste tests, people did not like it. So again, the question was, if you're Procter & Gamble, what do you do? And this is what their customer value model showed them, okay? Uh, on the brand dimension, they had no brand identity whatsoever. And on the taste dimension, people actually didn't like it. They preferred lard. So as you can see at the bullet at the bottom, they couldn't compete on brand or taste, so what do you do? And what they did was they, they created a new customer dimension. They had to go out and promote this, but the new dimension that they introduced was health. They made the claim that Crisco was healthier than 100% animal fat, which is what lard is, okay? They had to go out and educate the market on this point, okay? But because they were so dominant on this health dimension, okay, that by the time they did the customer value model, the, the advantage that they had in health was enough to overcome the disadvantages that they had on brand and taste. Okay, I hope that's clear. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and so the upshot of it is that they were, you know, obviously very, very successful. Um, in, you know, and even though they, we believe Procter & Gamble thought at the time, you know, that Crisco was healthier, um, it turned out, you know, decades later that because it was made of hydrogenated oil, which is the origin of trans fats, um, ironically, it probably wasn't even healthier. Um, Crisco is no longer made from trans fats, so, you know, they fixed sort of the product issues, but um, this is just an example of how they applied, you know, this thinking to reposition a product that was already available, you know, by re-educating a market and recreating, um, you know, different customer dimensions. All right. Um, we're just about out of time and I'm just about on my last slide. So, um, as you know, I mean, we've written this book. Uh, it's available at Amazon. I encourage you all to go check it out. We also have a website with some additional information. If you do buy the book, we love, love, love reviews. So please, you know, put a review in at Amazon. Um, the slides again are available on my LinkedIn page. You can see the, my LinkedIn link there again. My email address is also there in case any of you, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to follow up with me or connect with me on LinkedIn. So 
unimaginably, and I mean that sort of heroically, since I was really worried about getting through all this, we're doing really well on time. So I'll open it up for questions, but I'll turn it back to Laura or whoever's kind of moderating to uh, keep us on track. And let me unshare my screen here so I can rejoin you in person. And for as much time as we have remaining, I'm happy to, uh, to take questions. We did have one that came in, Neil, earlier, um, just asking about small business, small businesses during the pandemic. And I was thinking of how you just shared the PNG story as well, that sometimes you need to iterate and pivot to where the market's going. Any thoughts as businesses are challenged right now to think differently? Obviously, we're all sitting on Zoom, which is something we didn't do before. So there's uh, new opportunities as well. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually a believer that um, crises like the one that we're going through create massive new opportunities. So if you're an existing business, you know, or if you were owned a restaurant, for example, you know, on March 13th, you might find what we just went through to be almost insurmountable. But from an entrepreneurial perspective, we can see that the crisis has created all sorts of new opportunities for personal protection equipment, new types of software for people you know, able to meet and interact together online. So clearly there's damage done, okay? But there's also a lot of new opportunities. And if you have an existing business, um, my brief advice, because all of this would be very situational, is to go back to the fundamentals, which is the notion of product market fit. If your market has gone away because of the pandemic, then you got a problem. You either need to find another market, you need to iterate your product features, or you know whatever. Um, or you know if your market is now demanding new things from you, like a lot of the automobile manufacturers stepped up and started making ventilators, for example, because they had that capability, and you know their existing market, which was automobiles, almost completely dried up for a couple of months, and so that was a way for them to pivot into a new market to take advantage of capability that they had. So, you know, I think every business has to just, you know, evaluate the circumstances for themselves. But rather than being, um, you know, terrified, um, I think uh, a, a better, a healthier outlook is to, is to think like an entrepreneur and figure out where the new opportunities are. Great. Do we have any questions? I know I saw Todd, you commented. I don't know if there's anything in your work on innovation and you've been studying different platforms and in innovation that you wanted to add to this conversation. Hey, Neil, this is Todd Hart from Graybar. Um, we have an innovation lab there in Research Park. And I, no, I think what you say uh, really resonates. Um, you know, we are, as an organization, you know, we're large, um, seven, eight billion dollar company. and I think, um, hopefully not, not speaking too much out of turn, but I, but I think a struggle of our organizations, which certainly isn't much different, I think, than other large companies, is just the, 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 the intersection of innovation and strategy. And um, we recently moved, my, my operation recently moved from IT into the chief strategy officer. And so um, I, I think much, much of what you're saying really kind of smacks of, you know, that intersection. So it really wasn't a question, but just I really enjoy what you, you know, what you've said. Well, thank you. I mean, I would echo that. It's hard to imagine, even if you're one of the companies that might be benefiting from the pandemic, and certainly there are those, you know, and there's no shame in that. Um, I, you know, if I were running a business today, I mean, I would clearly be completely rethinking my strategy from top to bottom either to double down on those things that are working or to pivot or, you know, abandon things. Again, highly situational. It's hard to just, you know, simplify advice that would apply for everybody. But uh, I'm, I have to imagine that, you know, every executive in the world over the past couple of months has been, has gone back to the drawing board to kind of rethink everything about their business from top to bottom. I mean, I work for a university at the moment. I'm at Michigan State and you know, we're getting pay cuts and furloughs and all of that sort of thing. And there's hardly, you know, a more stable sort of secure uh, kind of entity in the world that's insulated from economic shocks than universities. But nonetheless, you know, we're in crisis mode right now. So.
Well, thank you, Neil. Um, I appreciate you spending time with us today. 